I've got the add sub module here from my RISC-V CPU and it's connected through to the register file that I built in the previous video. I have the first and second registers feeding into the adder and the result of the add is then alternating between being written back to register 1 and then register 2. And the result of that is to generate a Fibonacci sequence. And while it's great to see these two boards working together, there are still a few more modules that need to be built before the CPU can even process a simple add instruction. And the next module that I'll build is somewhere to store the instructions. And I want the instructions to be persisted when the module is turned off. So I'll need a different kind of memory to what I've used before. And to do that, I'm going to use a ROM. Typically, I'm going to use an electronically erasable programmable read-only memory, or an EEPROM. But to see how they work, we first need to have a look at how a transistor works. If we have a look at this transistor here, it's an N-channel field effect transistor. It has three pins. We have a source, which is the source of electrons. We have a drain, which is where the electrons will flow through. So we'll get a flow of electrons from source to drain. And then we have a gate, which acts like a switch to enable the source drain current to flow. If we connect the source up to ground and say pull the drain up to a source such as a five volt source, we still won't get any current flowing in this configuration, not until we connect up the gate. If we connect the gate to say five volts, then the voltage from the gate to the source will enable the transistor. This works by building up a charge on the gate and that draws electrons into the channel. So we form a channel that connects source and drain and that channel allows a current to flow. Okay, but this obviously only works when we have power connected. The way that we store information inside of a transistor is by adding in a floating gate. Now this gate is not electrically connected to anything and it doesn't actually stop the operation of the transistor in its current form. However, we can store a charge, a permanent charge on this floating gate. And because it's not electrically connected, once we store a charge on there, it doesn't go away. And so we have persistent storage by storing that in there. And notice that the current stopped flowing. And that's because the charge stored on the floating gate counteracts the positive charge that was stored up on the gate's plate. But how do we get that charge in there in the first place? Well, we can connect up our gate to a higher voltage, and this is enough to break down the isolation layer around the floating gate and draw electrons into it to build up that charge. If we now reset our gate to five volts, we have our standard five volt difference across the gate and source, but nothing can flow because of those electrons in the floating gate canceling out the charge on the gate. Okay, so we call this a zero. The transistor is disabled by virtue of the fact that the floating gate has a charge stored in it. We also need a, an erase operation and that will clear the electrons. Uh, we do that by reversing the voltage across the gate and source. So we set our gate to zero, set our source to some higher voltage, and that will draw the electrons out of the floating gate and into the body of the transistor. Now, when we set our transistor back to its original configuration, the current can again flow. And so we say this is storing a one. The transistor is enabled, the floating gate doesn't have a charge. Of course we need more than just one bit, so I'm going to use this AT28C64 EEPROM chip, and this has 64 kilobits or 8 kilobytes of memory. If we scroll down to the block diagram, you can see that it allows me to access 8 bits at a time, and this is for reading or writing. So I'll need 4 of these chips in parallel to get my 32 bits. You can see that we have an output enable, write enable and chip enable over on the left and I'll need to use these to control the reading and writing operations. So I have four of the EEPROM chips here and all the address lines are connected in parallel so that each chip is receiving the same address and then the eight bits of data from each will be concatenated together to get our 32 bits of data either in or out. The instruction memory shares the same address space as the RAM and potentially a number of other devices such as I.O. And the instruction memory sits at the beginning of that address space. So I have some logic here that will only enable the EEPROMs when I am at that beginning. So in other words, when the address bit 31 through to 15 are all zeros. Now, 
if you are observant, you will notice that the address lines on the EEPROMs here are from 0 to 14, so it's a 15-bit address, but the chips I'm using are only 13 bits. The reason for this is there is a drop-in replacement for this that is, in fact, 256 kilobits in size and therefore has a 15-bit address, and they're pin-for-pin -pin compatible. So I thought I might as well make this compatible with that larger chip just in case I decide to swap it out in the future. But for now I'll be using the 64-bit versions. In order to write to these when the CPU is switched off and I have the Arduino plugged in, I need some way of getting all of those data bits and all of those address bits out. So I'll be using one of these I.O. expanders again. Now I say again, these are MCP23S17s. In the past I've used the MCP23017. The difference is these are SPI driven and uh, the way that the data output works means it's fully bi-directional, which will be convenient here. Thanks to a commenter on one of my previous videos pointing out these chips. Uh, hopefully they'll overcome some of the limitations of the zero variant that I've used before. So the only outputs I need from the Arduino here are the standard SPI outputs. So that's the power and ground, master out, slave in, master in, slave out, the serial clock and the chip select lines. But I also need a couple of extra ones here to be able to control the EE prom chips. So I have the write enable and output enable connecting up to those. And with that I should be able to set the address and data lines and program them. I've gone ahead and designed and implemented the PCB and in fact I've already sent off and had these PCBs printed. The way that I'll program the ROMs is through the ICSP header that I have on the instruction ROM module and I'll connect that to the Arduino's ICSP header with a couple of additional connections for the write enable and output enable signals. Over in Arduino I've created three instances of the MCP23S17 and this is just using the library that comes with Arduino. Each one has a different address. Uh, for some reason I've used address 0, 2 and 3 and those are the addresses that are wired into the three address pins on the three chips. The write ROM function here implements the writing procedure specified by the ROM datasheet. Firstly, we disable the output by bringing the OE signal high. Then we set the address. And setting the address also sets the chip enable because if you remember how the OR circuit worked, that actually sets the chip enable low as well. We then have to honor the output enable setup time, the address setup time, and the chip enable setup time. And so I have a brief delay here to do that. We then set the write signal to low and set the data. And we have a minimum and in fact a maximum pulse width for the write enable. So I have another short delay to account for that. And finally we bring the write enable high and that completes the write cycle. And I can simply call this function for each instruction that I want to write into the ROM. All right, let's load this onto the board and check that it has written to the ROM modules. Okay, there we go. So all of the data is written to the ROM and I've just written out a dummy program that does a couple of ads over and over again. To test if this has been successfully written to the ROM, I'll once again use my test card. So I'll plug the ROM module into that now and run a test script that will read the data from the ROM and display it in the serial monitor. The script simply iterates through each instruction, sets the address and reads the data via the card edge connector and then displays that on the serial monitor. All right, let's run that test and see if everything's worked. Okay, it looks like the data has been successfully written to the ROM, so that's great. But there's no good way to visualize what's going on here. We can't see what instruction we are reading without having the Arduino or the test card plugged in. So in the next video, I'm going to prepare a decode module, which will show us what instruction is currently being read and will decode the instruction ready to start sending control signals to the rest of the CPU.